So I find it really kind of gross that right off the bat I have to do this because it's uh, two days before Christmas-ish at this point. And the uh, comments sections in my videos just across the board for years one and two directed at me and directed at other commenters have gotten more and more toxic and gross and wrong in the past few weeks. And I find that really, really abhorrent in this time of tis the damn season. So for those of you who may be new here and don't actually understand how things go, or for those of you who might need a refresher, um, tis the damn season where we are right now. This is the season of giving, of loving, of gratitude, of comfort and joy. It is not the season of giving headaches and heartbreaks to the humans around you because you need a place to direct your stress. So, again, as a refresher, this channel does not tolerate any of that. If you shitpost in my comments to me or to any other commenter, you get the boot. Sometimes you get a soft block and you don't even know that you've gotten the boot. But every single time, if I see it, I will address it because it's not cool. This is the holiday season. We are supposed to be kind and loving and awesome individuals year round, preferably, but for sure during this time. Okay, cool. Now we can actually get onto the point of the video, which actually does have nothing whatsoever to do with what I just said. It's just, come on guys, stop being jerks. For those of you who are being jerks, the majority of you are great. You guys are my sudsers and I love you. I will tell my sudsers who I love so very much, what we are doing in just a minute. But before I do, hello, I am Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things, and you are here for day 203 of 365 days of soap. And today we're actually doing something kind of fun. We're going to be playing with Tear Maker and ranking like lye infusions, weird additives that you can put into lye, right? I figured this would be a two for today because I get questions all of the time about insert X, Y, or Z additive in a lye solution and what the benefits are. And also, I wanted to sort of give my opinions on these sorts of things. So the rankings themselves, that will be my opinion. Like, this is just how I use it, whether or not I would. But for this list, we will also talk about the supposed benefits of the 12 that I've selected for this video and, you know, what people say about it and what it does realistically to soap or what it could do to soap. So that's what we are doing today. And I would like to start this entire thing out with a very big disclaimer. I honestly believe that every single one of these additives, first and foremost, high level, it's going to be more for label appeal than anything else. However, that is not to say that these lye infusions, that these additives that you can put in your lye solution in place of all of or part of your water don't have a benefit because they super do. So let's talk about those things in context of what we do know when it comes to soap. Speaking of what we do know when it comes to soap, I like to approach soap scientifically, right? And that's just where my brain exists. And while I understand saponification, the fatty acid chains, and everything that goes into actually turning these oils and the lye into 
you know, soap. There has not been a ton of studies that have been really done on this like $186 billion a year industry from a scientific perspective. So while I believe certain things based on my chemical knowledge, there's nothing really to back this up. And so again, these are just my opinions. I did find a very interesting study, which I will link below. I highly encourage you guys to go read it. It's really very cool. It was just published a couple years ago, which gives me big hope that other chemists are going to continue, you know, doing things with the soap making process and saponification and the cold process method versus hot process and all the things to give us more really concrete journal peer reviewed you know, documentation out there to help us along our soapy journeys. So this one is about 45 pages long. I definitely recommend you reading it. It will all be below. It's a very fascinating read for sure. But again, off the top, these are just my opinions on what I think does or does not survive saponification, whether or not it has a benefit in soap outside of effectively what it does to the lather or the bar hardness. Make sense? Cool. So let's get to this list. Now, as I said, I selected 12 additives to lye. Now, some of them are going to be additives in the place of water. Some of them are just going to go into your lye solution with just a normal water, you know, thing. So first up, I had to create my own list on Tear Maker in order to make this a thing because it's not a, it's not a thing. And so the categories that I have are we stand, which means I stand. I, I, I like these infusions. I like these lye enhancements. We like, I like, I like, they're decent. Uh, we could mess with, sure. I can see myself playing with that. Maybe would be, I don't know. I guess if my circumstances changed and a different route that I wanted to take within my soaping world, I might play with them. And uh, the last one is going to be, I can't. And again, these are just, this is just based on my opinion on all of these things. And so... I can't is not going to be something that's like necessarily a bad thing to put into soap. It's just for me personally, I, I can't do it for, for, for reasons that we will get into. So first up are going to be the silks. And so we are going to talk about essentially the Tussa silks, the corn silks, and the snakeskin, which reacts much like a silk in soap right off the bat. And so that's kind of an easy peasy one. Uh, the silks are a very interesting, just an additive into a lye solution, right? So you're not worrying about a water substitution or a water discount or anything like that. It's just an extra thing that you put into your lye water after you have, you know, weighed out your water, put in your lye, dissolved your lye, and then in the hot lye solution, you would put in a quantity of one of these silks. So what are these silks? Well, the Tussa silks are from like silkworms, right? So therefore not vegan. So if you are thinking about doing that um, and you're running a vegan shop, I would steer away from Tussa silks right off the bat. Uh, they're from the cocoons and I believe caterpillars are killed in the process of getting it. And so that's problematic for me. Uh, snake skin, also not vegan, obviously. It comes from the, the snake, not vegan but also not cruel because that's a natural process that snakes go through like one to four times a year or something. It's wild. And then you have corn silk, which also acts in soap just like the other two. And it's your vegan option, right? And so corn silks are literally the fibers from corn. Like when you get corn on the cob and you open the thing and there's the little, the little hairs, those, yes. And so what they do in soap, well, the first two with the Tussa silk and the snake skin, they're both high in keratin, which is a protein. And this is a protein that, I mean, you can do a very quick Google search and see, see how keratin hair treatments and masks and all kinds of things are highly beneficial for your hair, for your nails, for the elasticity of your skin. I mean, keratin is a cool thing. For sure and that's definitely found within the tessa silk as well as the snakeskin not necessarily found in the corn silk because it is a different type of protein but in soap it's rumored to do the same thing in soap it does the same thing as far as adding a silky lather to the soap which is 
really where you should go. What does it actually do as far as like the lather and the performance of the bar? Because <laughs> for the snake skin, I saw on freaking Amazon a rattlesnake soap that did nothing but list like 19 drug claims, medicinal claims, which we can't do. We, we can't say that rattles, that's any of our soaps like cure eczema and dermatitis and acne, all, all the things. And so shy away from that, right? Because we don't want to make any drug claims. But as far as what it does in the soap, all three of these things give a really creamy, silky lather. And it's quite delightful for sure. Me personally, I think that all soap has a nice silky lather regardless, but this is a nice way to up the ante. So that's very cool. Um, with the addition of the keratin, if you were to go down the path of that protein survives saponification, it is an unsaponifiable, A, you would have to put it in high enough amounts in the soap, in a rinse off product, for it to super matter anyway, and I'm talking pretty high percentages, like a lot of silks are going to go into your lye solution, which could lead to weird problems, right? And two, if it does survive, then yeah, keratin's cool. Like that would be a good addition to shampoo bars, to face bars, et cetera, et cetera. And again, the protein strand is not the same in corn silk because we are looking at a vegetable versus an animal but the structure of the chain is so similar that the corn silk does essentially the same thing. So all really cool things to put into soap for the silkiness of the lather. And if the keratin survives saponification, another added boost. So that's pretty cool. So for my part, um, for the silks and the snake skin, I can't. Um, for one of the reasons is the same. The other reason is just kind of petty. The first reason is I run a vegan shop. And so I don't do animal products at all, you know? And so for that reason, I can't. I can't do. If I did not run a vegan shop, I would totally mess with the... If I did not run a vegan shop, I would totally mess with the Tussa Silk. So I guess Tussa Silk goes into the maybe, because if I decided to switch my entire line and to you know mess with any sort of animal byproducts, which is totally co cool if that's what you wanna do, it's just not what I do. We all get to make our own choices. Then I guess Tussa Silk becomes a maybe. And for the corn silk, I'm gonna put up with I could mess with. I generally don't mess with it. I will put corn silk into my soaps like in the summertime for funsies or if specifically requested by someone. But for the most part, I don't do it. It's not a staple in my line. It's not something that I always have to have a, a supply of to enhance my lye waters. So there's that. And really the reason why the snake skin is in the I can't is because snakes freak me out. They just, they freak me out. So I can't, I, I can't, I can't. I have heard amazing things about snakeskin in soap though. And so if you've tried it and you love it and you swear by it, that's great. Just also know that there are some vegan alternatives to that. And there is a less squidgy alternative to that in the form of the Tessa silk. Although it still makes me feel bad because caterpillars die. So I don't know. But for snakes, I can't because I can't, I can't touch it. I just, I, it's the only reason it's there. As far as whether or not the keratin survives with any of these, I don't know. Um, definitively, we don't know. My opinion is it does. The, the protein strand does survive saponification. But again, it's such a small percentage that we tend to put the, the silks, be it the corn, the tussa, or the snake skin into our lye waters that it's not really going to have any huge benefit on hair and or skin unless you really up those percentages and put a lot in and two even if it did we're still dealing with a rinse off product so it's always up in the air for hair i could see it better than for skin um actually in both cases for hair and skin because you're meant to wash your face a pretty long time and your hair you know, lather it up and keep it on there while you're, you know, doing other things or whatever, then yeah, there could be some benefit to both. 
if the keratin survives, for sure. But again, you would have to really increase the amount with which you're using it. So there's those three. Easy peasy right off the bat, for sure. And um, so far, nothing that I super stan. Next up on this list is milk. And I'm going to, for brevity's sake, lump all milks in together. So let's talk about cow's milk, goat's milk, coconut milk. We're not talking about breast milk because that's a secondary one on this too that I want to talk about separately, but milks. So in a milk soap, what you would be doing, which is different than what you would do with the silk fibers, instead of just adding a little bit of extra to it, realistically what you would be doing is replacing a portion or all of your water in your lye solution, in your recipe, with a milk. Now this can be a full replacement, this can be a partial replacement. You can reserve some of that replacement and put it in the batch after you've hit an emulsion. You can also do that with a hot process recipe and put it in, you know, after the cook, those sorts of things. There are a number of ways that you can incorporate milks into your recipes, but usually you are replacing the majority of your water content when doing so. So what does milk do in soap? Well, the first thing that we know it does is it is going to be essentially super fatting your soaps more because there's fat in milk. So that's something that you do need to pay attention to while you're formulating your recipes. You don't want too high of a super fat, or maybe you do. It all depends on what you're making. Now, as far as the benefits of milk themselves as to what it does for the performance of the bar, makes a nice creamy lather. It's a very beautiful creamy lather for sure. And for what it does as far as the benefits of including it in a soap recipe outside of just what the bar does and how it performs, well, I mean, milk has, you know, a lot of vitamins, a lot of nutrients, high in lactic acid, and we're familiar with lactic acid, right? It's a very gentle exfoliant, it helps with sloughing off dead skin cells. It's in a lot of, you know, high-end, you know, face treatments and stuff like that. And adding a milk with the extra creaminess and all of the benefits of the nutrients and all the jazz can be really good and well suited for sensitive skin. And so this is one of the reasons why goat's milk soap is so wildly popular among the sensitive skin crowd. Now, when it comes to goat's and cow's milk soaps, uh, obviously not vegan, right? So again, if you are trying to run a vegan line, you should not do that. If you are running a vegan line and you want an alternative, Coconut milk is a very good alternative, for sure. You do want to pay attention to the oils that you're including in a recipe that, in, that contains milk, though. You want to make sure that you have a big bubbler within that recipe. And I think we're talking about, like, the quest for the big bubble recipe tomorrow in a deeper way. Yes. But... You want something that has a big bubble because yes, this lather is going to be very creamy, but you can overdo it and very creamy can lead to no lather payoff at all. And the end user might not like that, even though it is good for sensitive skin. So keep that in mind for sure. Also an important thing to keep in mind, and we've talked about this when we've made milk soaps in the past, and you know, we'll talk about it again right now, is that milk does have sugars in it. And so you do need to pay attention to the way that you're incorporating it into your lye solution. If you don't want your soaps to brown, to turn a beige color or like a tan color, then you might want to consider freezing your milks and using them in ice cube form in place of your water solution or putting them in in a secondary after an emulsion to avoid the potential browning, the scorching of the sugars, which will lead to browning of the soaps. I personally don't care about the browning first. Second, I don't find it to be that bad. So a nice creamy colored bar of soap is, you know, absolutely delightful for sure. So I usually skip that whole step of freezing my milks, but I also have shown you how to do that on the channel before. So you can go check those out if you're interested in making milk soaps. For me personally, um, I like milk. I use it enough that... I use coconut milk quite a bit. I don't do anything with cows and goats because, you know, vegan, but I have made cows and goats milk soaps in the past to see if there's any real difference between that and a coconut milk soap. I have determined that there is not. And so I like 
Yeah, I like. It's a really good addition to something like a soap for younger skin, for sensitive skin, for stuff like that. And also, it's something to consider when you are incorporating, you when you are building a recipe for like a face bar, for a face cleanser, because of the aforementioned lactic acid. Now, does lactic acid survive saponification? Um, I think it does. I do think it's another one of those instances like the keratin though, and you have to use it in high enough concentrations for it to matter. The cool thing is about milk, since you are substituting the majority of your water, usually for a milk, you're using it in pretty high amounts. So those benefits could impart for sure. And as far as the extra vitamins and nutrients and whatnot that comes from milk, sure, yeah. At the end of the day, what we super know and what we can super claim is that milk soaps have a great creamy lather and are suitable for all skin types. You can easily make that claim and know that you're not gonna go wrong with milk soaps. So for that, I would put milk soaps in we like. We like, for sure. Now, next up would be tea, tea soaps. Now I've done some tea infusions on the channel back when I was messing with um, Plum Deluxe, whose teas are still delightful. Go check them out, go get some teas. They're so much fun. And I like tea soaps quite a bit. I actually do stan tea soaps. So I love the bubble. First off the bat, with the antioxidants and the tannins that are included in teas and the flavonoids. And this is actually tea and coffee both. This is an infusion for both tea and coffee. So you have lots of antioxidants within your teas and your coffee. You have the tannins, you have the flavonoids. And for what it does as far as performance of the soap goes, it creates a really big, beautiful, epic bu bubble. It's almost an effervescent bubble. It's very, very delightful. I stan tea and coffee soaps for sure. Now, does any of the benefits, like the health benefits of tea and coffee, translate into skin benefits? That one is one that is a question mark for me. I cannot definitively say yes or no with this. Um, I see a marked difference as far as lather from one recipe that has tea instead of water and one that has just water as far as performance goes. As far as the health benefits, skin-wise, leave-on product, probably not. As far as the caffeine, I'm also going to go with probably not, but for the lather performance, for that big bubble payoff, I love it for sure. This is a good thing to put into soaps that have a small amount of like your big bubble oils, like your coconut oils to really boost that lather for sure. Now with tea and coffee, you're going to incorporate it basically the same way as you would incorporate your milks into your soaps and you would do a full or partial water replacement within your lye solution itself, or you could reserve some of that water and you know just use it at the end after you've hit emulsion or you've gone through the cook with hot process, which is always a really good way to do a fun fluid hot process batter to put some extra liquid or reserve some of the liquid to put in at the end, at the end of the cook, so then you can swirl and do your things. So with teas and coffees though, you are running the risk of your waters being dark and therefore your soap being dark almost no matter what. Now I did four coffee soaps in the last six weeks or so, and I did four tea soaps sometime in the summer. So you can go back and reference those videos to see what kind of change there is and how much you can sort of combat that using your colorants, your micas, your titanium dioxide, et cetera, et cetera. I had none problem actually getting a pure white out of tea soaps. It's a little bit harder to do in a coffee soap. Can be done. It's kind of not worth the effort though. So keep that in mind for your designs. You may very well be dealing with some darker colored soaps, some tans, some beiges, some caramels, all of the things. But as far as tea itself, tea and coffee, we stand. I stand. I love tea and coffee soaps and they are a staple in my line across the board. So there's that. Love them. Okay, so next up is beer, or beer and wine, or beer, wine, and White Claw, really, because we did White Claw soaps in the summertime, and yeah, I was a big fan of that lather. Do you guys remember those mango ones? They were really beautiful. That lather was incredible. And so for the alcohol soaps, the beers, the wines, the White Claws, etc., I absolutely do stand just right off the bat, so we can just put it right there 
big fan. They are a huge staple in my line. They are never out of stock because I have to make hundreds of them every week just to make sure that everybody who loves them and buys them and does whatever gets to continue to do so. So first and foremost for beer, wine, white claw, for alcohol-based soaps, you are looking at a lot of sugars. And a lot of sugars means a great bubble payoff. And so that's awesome right away. So that's definitely something to consider incorporating again into your soaps that have a low bubble oil in there. So like maybe like an olive oil with a beer, which is actually a delightful, delightful recipe. Like a Castile soap made out of beer. Super cool. Love that. Beer has a problem and that is not gluten-free. So you have to pay attention to that for sure. Uh, White Claw, I actually don't know. I have no idea if White Claw is gluten-free. So that's something that would need to be researched if you are looking for a gluten-free option for, you know, alcohol soaps. Another benefit to the wine, beer, white claw, to your alcohol soaps would be for beer, you have all the hops and wine, you know, soaps are supposed to be very antioxidant rich as well. All three of those options make these really well suited for sensitive skin types. Again, assuming the sensitivity for the skin is not a gluten intolerance or celiac, you know, so definitely pay attention to that. But they're because of the qualities that exist within a beer or wine or even a white claw, it's going to be more about the sugars than anything else because it's going to be boosting that big awesome lather. So if you'd rather not mess around with alcohols in your soaps, just stick with sugar which we'll get to, you know, in a little bit, and we'll talk more in depth about that. But when you are incorporating your beer and your wine and your white claw into your soaps, again, you do have to take some precautions if you want to, much like you would with a milk, and uh, consider freezing your beers and your wines and your white claws because we have carbonation issues, we have sugar issues, which means we're going to have scorched lye issues. I have shown you what happens when you don't do any of that, and nothing disastrous. So that's again, another one of those corners that I cut because I don't have that kind of time to prep. And so it's very rare that I actually use beer, wine, or white claw in ice cube form, but you can do. Now, this is another thing that you would use a full or a partial water replacement. And that really does have more to do with what that particular inclusion is going to do in soap. Wine, it's usually better to do a 50% water replacement for your wine. Beer, you can go 100%. White Claw, we've gone 100% and there's been no problems with either one of those. As far as whether or not any of the benefits of the hops and all the antioxidants and all the jazz survive saponification, I don't know. I personally love using my beer and wine soaps. I find that they have an effervescent, beautiful bubble on my skin and they leave my skin nice and silky smooth and plumped and ready to go. That could just be me loving wine and beer soap so, so very much though. So realistically looking at whether or not their properties actually survive saponification, there's not enough information out there for me to actually definitively say yes. So therefore I'm just going with the really cool lather. So, but for me, alcohol soaps, I stand so hard for sure. Okay, so next up in the lye enhancements would be salt. Now, the next three are actually going to be enhancements that are easy to come by because they just sort of exist around your house and there's no real extra prep work that is required for any of them at all, which is cool. So first up would be salt. Now, there are two different ways that you can actually incorporate salt into your lye solution for two different purposes, really. So the first way would be adding salt in order to increase the hardness of the bar. And that's really easy peasy. You would use about a tablespoon of salt in your hot lye solution and dissolve it in there per pound of oil, one tablespoon of salt per pound of oil. And what kind of salt? God, literally any kind. It is, I mean, don't use Epsom salts, but anything else is fine. The table salt is gonna be your easiest, best way to do this. Himalayan salt. I mean, all of the salt salts, really, I have seen all manner of crazy salts used in soap. I have used all manner of crazy salts in soap. And for bar hardening, again, about a tablespoon per pound of oil into your hot lye solution, and it's going to increase the hardness of the bar. You also need to be careful 
with that because those sorts of soaps either need to be poured in individual cavity molds or you need to remove and cut them within like 12 hours of pouring. Otherwise, they're going to be too hard to really cut through. So keep that in mind. For bar hardening, it's great. And it does unfortunately decrease the lather. And so you really wanna make sure that your soap recipe has enough oils that produce a big bubble, like a coconut oil, to uh, counteract that. Now, another way to use salt in your soaps is to create a salt bar or a salt brine bar. Now, this is a different process entirely and not for the faint of heart because I really do believe you have to have multiple batches of soap under your belt before you start playing around with stuff like this because essentially what you're doing is you're taking like half to 75% of the oil weight within the recipe and adding that in the form of salt into your lye water, or again, dissolving it into hot water and reserving it for after emulsion and then putting it at that point. Now, the reason you're gonna do that is for all of these amazing things that you can't actually say soap does, right? It's detoxifying, it's great for acne, it's great for eczema, it's great for psoriasis, it helps out with insect bites. It's a, a salt brine bar is a great bar to make in the middle of summertime with your, that is citronella for like anti-insect stuff for sure problem is you can't say any of that does it work yeah no i i do think that there's a lot of really good antibacterial benefits to a salt brine bar can you say it not without making a medical claim so you can't really say it but i do believe the benefits exist there and for that reason salt brine bars are really good bars Again, you are definitely running into a problem with the lather at that point, though, because that much salt in a recipe, your lather is going to be nothing. Like, it's going to barely, it's going to be almost slimy, like an olive oil bar. So, you definitely need to pay attention to the oils that go into a recipe if you're going to start playing with a salt brine bar. But it is doable, and it is cool. I really quite like salt brine bars quite a lot, and considering it's such an easy thing to do as far as like having it around, because we always have salt hanging out, right? It's a good thing to include in your line. Once you have enough batches of soap under your belt to do it without being freaked out. And by freaked out, I mean, these are just things, this is an advanced soap making technique, and so you need to be prepared for any number of things to go wrong, i.e. your batter getting very thick very fast and not being able to, you know, do your pretty swirls and all of that jazz. And so if you want to do swirls, you then have to formulate your recipe and your soaping environment to accommodate that. And also um, how quickly it's going to harden. So you're gonna to need to be prepared for that and for the cutting. And also, also, salt brine bars tend to do this weird sweating period for like the first week of cure that might freak a lot of people out. It's all fine, like everything is going to be fine, but if you haven't seen it before or you don't know to expect it or to trust the process, you might assume that it's a failed batch of soap and just chuck it in the bin. You should not do so. You should let it sit and continue to cure. It's going to reabsorb. It's going to be a delightful bar of soap assuming you have those oils dialed in and it actually has a lather. So for me, salt bars, I actually make a crap ton of them. And so I would put up there with, we stand. I love salt bars for sure. Now, next up on this list is sugar. And sugar, again, that's an easy thing to add because we usually have it around. And we're talking sugar in the form of any type of sugar, white sugar, brown sugar, honey, those sorts of things. If you're going vegan, obviously don't use honey, although that's always a question mark. Some vegans eat honey. It's all about personal preference, really. But for sugar, it's gonna be the easiest way to boost lather across the board. So if you're working with like a Castile soap that, you know, historically and famously has a pretty crappy lather, consider adding sugar. Now you can add sugar to your solution and enhance your lye in a couple ways and or your soap in a couple ways. You can add uh, about a tablespoon per pound of oils to the lye solution, to the hot lye solution and do that. You can actually dissolve the sugar in warm water and then let the water cool down and then put in your lye solution. That tends to eliminate the risk of scorching of the sugars. You can do that. Or if you're really worried about the potential for discoloration, you can also take like your sugar 
and a portion of the waters that you would otherwise put into your lye solution and make like a simple syrup, right? And so essentially you're looking at like half a cup to a cup of sugar for like a standard three pound batch that you would dissolve in warm water and then add that after you've hit emulsion in your soap, thus eliminating the sugar scorching. And that will boost lather in really big epic ways. And the last one that I just talked about is the way that I would recommend doing like a Castile soap because you're going to get that really big sugar lather boost payoff doing it with a simple syrup as opposed to, I just want to increase the bubbles just a little bit, so I'm just going to put a splash into the lye water. Two different options, just like within the salt. And also, again, easy ways to incorporate a big lather payoff without having to mess with things like beers or wines or, you know, what have you. So for that reason, I would put sugar in we like. I can't say we stand because I don't use sugar in a crap ton of my recipes. I prefer to get the big bubble payoff with the oils themselves. But, you know, I use sugar enough in my in my recipes that I do recognize the actual value and I like it for sure. Now, next up is vinegar. And this was actually on here because someone asked me to talk about it. So vinegar and soap is weird. And there are all kinds of theories flying around there about the uh, benefit of vinegar and soap. And um, I'm actually going to go ahead and link an article from ultimatehpsoap.com below. And I highly encourage you to go and read it because they have explained it far better than, you know, I really could or care to. But it's a very deep investigation into uh, vinegar and why it really kind of is not beneficial in soap. The claims, especially when you're on like shampoo bar forums and people are trying to make natural shampoo bars, the claims about things like putting apple cider vinegar into your lye solution or using it like in a hot process cook after the cook and uh, sort of neutralizing it that way are out there. They are abundant and the claims that apple cider vinegar, you know, it is a natural chelator, which means it's great for hard water areas and hard water stains, which means you don't need your apple cider vinegar rinse with your, if you're going to be using a natural soap shampoo bar, uh, says that it lowers the pH of the soap, which makes it ideal for a shampoo bar. Uh, I'm not, I don't have time and I guess we could do an entire deep dive on vinegar really because it's just kind of that big and getting into the actual chemical formulation of this acid versus this acid and effectively what you really need to know with all of this when it comes to vinegar is it consumes a portion of the lye when you add it to your soaps and not in a way that like a citric acid is going to do, which we will also talk about as far as an additive for uh, your lye solutions. But if you're consuming a portion of the lye, really for like the argument that like the pH is lowered, the way that you're doing that is you're essentially creating a more super fatted bar. And by more super fatted bar, I mean a pretty exceptionally large percentage increase when you're using vinegar, because again, it is consuming a portion of the lye, which means less lye to react with the fatty acids, which means more free flowing fatty acids, which means a more super fatted soap. And so for me, it's like, well, why not just formulate your recipe to have that super fat and just don't mess with the vinegar at all, right? And as far as the chelating properties, they don't exist. That's not really what vinegar is in soap form because again, it's reacting with the lye and creating a new compound. Vinegar in and of itself, when you're like cleaning your shower doors in a hard water area using undiluted vinegar, yeah, that does work. Or vinegar plus baking soda also does work. Within soap form, it's a bust because we are dealing with too many different chemical compounds. Again, this is this is something that's a deep dive in and of itself, but net net my opinion on vinegar in soap, I would not mess with it. I don't think it's worth it. You can just formulate your recipe to have that higher super fat and therefore that lower pH, but we're talking about such a negligible difference in pH by having a higher super fat. Like you're never going to get a bar to neutral. It's not going to happen. So 
for me personally, I would say for vinegar, I can't. I, I just can't. I don't see an area that vinegar would be beneficial in place of any other ways of formulating your soap recipe. Again, I highly recommend going and reading the article that I linked below from ultimatehpsoap.com. Yes, that is hot process, but they did a very good job of explaining this pretty succinctly in a way that can be translated into cold process soap making as well. For me personally, vinegar, it's really not worth the hassle that comes with it because it does require a whole lot of extra maths to even figure out what you are working with and how you need to adjust your recipes and your ratios accordingly to ensure that you don't end up with a literal mess of gooey sludge on your hands when you start messing with vinegar. Just my opinion. Now, next up we have purees, and that is a wide topic in and of itself. And I guess that's another one for just a whole ass deep dive on what all these different purees could or can or do in soap. And so, because we're dealing with any number of fruits and or vegetables in puree form being used within your lye solution in substitution of a portion or all of your water. And the biggest thing that you're going to get with the majority of certainly fruits is going to be the increase of sugar. So you're going to get a big, awesome lather boost, which is awesome. Granted, fruits and vegetables, they also have a lot of like nutritional values as well. Whether they survive the saponification process, I don't know. I don't know. Honestly, I put purees into my soaps and I've done a couple of them on the channel over the past two years, mostly for label appeal. Like that's really what it is. I know that it's going to have a big, beautiful, awesome bubble, but if I'm making a mango scented soap for the summertime, why not also use a mango puree? And that's really what I do focus on when I am using a puree in that regard. Now there are other purees, like I did the Camocado in the first year on the soap channel, pretty sure. Yeah, and that in addition to increasing the lather, it also increases the super fat by quite a bit because an avocado is heavy in fats. And so that's another way to increase your super fat for good or for ill. Again, I tend to go to just make sure your recipe is dialed in and you have the super fat that you want and then you don't have to mess with even figuring out what that super fat now is with the, the addition of, you know, the extra fats that are coming from your avocado. Um, carrots, you know, I mean, we're looking at carrots are mostly water, antioxidant, good for the skin, plumping, sure-ish, but again, whether or not it survives saponification, I don't know. Purees are a fun, cool way to ultimately add some lather, for sure. It's a good lather booster. And also, you can naturally color your soaps with that. So that's also very cool. So for me, I would put in We Can Mess With. I don't do a ton of purees, but when I do, again, it's mostly for label appeal or just to stick with an entire theme. And for that reason, it's cool. Whether or not it has a big benefit that you couldn't get just as easily from something else, eh. Not really. So yeah, I can mess with it, but I don't stand. Okay, so next up is breast milk. And I hate this. Breast milk is a thing. It's a movement. It's it's there. It's all happening. Um, breast milk is going to... Okay, first up, let's just talk about what breast milk does in soap, okay? Breast milk in soap is mostly going to act the exact same way that all other milks do. So you've got your extra unsaponifiable acids in there. You have the extra fat boost. Again, depending on what type of breast milk you have going on there and what kind of person is eating. Breast milk is wildly fascinating in how much it changes from you know moment to moment and based on what the person is eating and how hydrated they are and what their baby's nutrient needs even are like the female body is just this magical like it it's magic like it's magic how that adjusts and so you can't for sure you know really determine exactly what is in breast milk but for the most part it's mostly water and you know of course you have your nutrients and all of that jazz and some percentage of fat again the fat percentage changes based on 
any number of things. And I'm sure that any of you who have ever breastfed know that, get that. Like that's a thing. You can just tell by, you know, pumping from one day to the next. So it's going to interact much the same way as any other milk. So benefits for sure. Uh, gentle skin stuff for sure, for sure. If the rest of the milk soaps are good for gentle skin, then so too is breast milk. Um, it's gimmicky as shit. Like it really is. And I have seen thrown about that it is against the law to make breast milk soap. Uh, currently, as it stands in the United States, it is not. It is not illegal to sell breast milk. Therefore, it is not illegal to sell breast milk soaps. It is currently, as it stands, unregulated. And I know that seems wild, but I've never bothered to do this. Have you ever bothered to do this? Have you ever even like bothered to look up if it's illegal to sell bodily fluids in general? Because that's what that is. That's a bodily fluid, isn't it? It's illegal to sell bodily fluids, US. Um, yeah, no. That actually looks like you can sell Hair, plasma, sperm, eggs, breast milk, skin, the placenta in capsules, um, breast milk, and a number of other bodily fluids are currently legal to sell. It's unregulated, which means legal. Um, like, that is legitimately weird for me that you can sell bodily fluids, but you can do. So I guess it's not illegal to sell and distribute breast milk soap. But for me, I think it's gimmicky as shit. If you're making it for somebody like a personal use, like they want to use their own breast milk in their own soap that they are using for themselves, I mean, sure, fine. I would just sell them a recipe, though, or just give them one and say, why don't you make it? But I, because I, I, I can't. I can't. And I don't know why I can't. Maybe I'm just like the biggest prude in the world when it comes to, you know, breast milk. Because well, how is that any different than cow's milk or goat's milk or whatever? It's not. But I, I don't want to. So I can't just for the same reason as snakes. It just kind of squigs me out. None of that makes sense at all because I donated my breast milk while I was breastfeeding both of my children to people who needed breast milk all of the time. So I don't get why this squigs me out, but it does. So for me, I don't. Uh, technically, from what I can see on the interwebs, it's not illegal to do so. So if you want to, I mean, do your thing. I will stick with the regular milks and well, I mean, really, I'm gonna stick with coconut milk because breast milk, again, not vegan. So there's also that. Okay, so now finally we have citric acid and citric acid is going to be, citric acid effectively does everything that people claim vinegar does, but it actually does it. And the reason for that is completely different chemical compound and therefore a completely different chemical that exists after it interacts with lye. Now citric acid does also consume lye when it is, you know, put into a solution. So you do have to keep your measurements pretty, pretty strict and look out for that. Essentially you're adding more lye than you normally would to a soap to combat that. But citric acid when combined with lye does form your chelator. So it's great for hard water areas. It is great for soap stains and soap scum and all of that jazz. It is great for that thing called dreaded orange spots and rancidity within your oils and or your soap. It is great for boosting a lather and it is great for bar hardening. So citric acid, that is a really easy thing to add to your lye solution for sure. So like one tablespoon per pound of oils should do the trick. You can definitely play with more in the form of dissolving it and, you know, putting it into your soap batter. Uh, I've, I've heard tell that people do that and have lots of success. I've never done it that way. I just add it directly to my warm lye solution, particularly in things like dish soaps or laundry sticks, stuff like that. 
But again, if you are making soap in an area that has hard water, that's a great addition. Boosts the lather, extends the shower life of the soap, and does not lead to soap scum. So that's awesome. It actually does the things that people say apple cider vinegar does in, in soap. Like it does that. So citric acid is awesome. I don't use it a ton in my soaps. I, I make a shit ton of dish soaps, but I don't use it a lot outside of that. But yeah, yeah, in a pinch, like if somebody was messaging me and saying that they're having some lather problems with my soaps, which had zero lather problems here where I don't have hard water, I would definitely make them some custom soaps and put some citric acid in to help that out and see if that helps for sure. So yeah, citric acid we like. We like citric acid a lot. And that is another easy, easy, inexpensive way to actually incorporate a really beneficial, you know, additive to your lye without any sort of complicated extra steps. Just again, do keep in mind that because citric acid does consume lye, you need to increase the amount of your lye solution. I usually increase it by about 1.5% to combat that and everything is good to go. So there's all that. So wrapping this all up, what does it all mean? It means that there are a lot of really cool weird things that you can put into your soaps, well, into your lye solutions really, because there are even more weird cool things that you can put into your soaps and uh, they all have their benefits and their costs. So pay attention to all of that as you're formulating your recipes. And you know, that's my final ranking within everything. I should probably do a screen cap of that, right? And realistically, the only three that I can't mess with, it's because two of them freak me out. And the third, there's no real benefit to using them the way that I make soap. So the way that I approach the soap making process, I don't need vinegar in my life. But there it is. And what you decide to put into your soap is completely up to you. And this is, again, just kind of scratching the surface on other crazy things that you can put into your soap. So, of course, I want to know what kind of crazy things you put into your lye solution and uh, what you might have questions about things that maybe you've heard about and you wonder, is this beneficial? And we can talk about that too. I did not touch on sodium lactate today. Sodium lactate is going to be, for me, no different than salt. I think salt is easier to use than sodium lactate because salt is always available and you might run out of sodium lactate. But when do we run out of salt? Actually, that's not a fair question because I think I'm currently out of salt in my house right now. But, you know, in normal houses that know how to grocery shop, you always have salt on hand. So if you need a bar hardener, do that thing. Sodium lactate can extend the life of the bar. Oh look, I'm talking about it, it's not even on my list. Sodium lactate can extend the trace of the soap for sure. So in a pinch, if your soap is getting overly thick, you can put a little bit of sodium lactate in and you can continue on with your fluid pour. So that's a benefit to sodium lactate. Other than that, I'm fine with salt for the actual benefits of the bar hardening and the ease of getting it out of the mold faster. So there's that. Uh, yeah, that's my list. That's what I'm going with for sure. And again, drop all of your information and your comments and all the jazz, you know, below. That would be super cool. And going full circle back to the way I started this uh, whole entire, you know, video today. Let's be nice to each other, peoples. I know that this is the time for like stress in tis the damn season, but it's not meant to be. And just because you're stressed out doesn't mean you need to take it out on other people. Now, for those of you who are feeling stress and, you know, need to work things through or whatever, I am here for you. I am here to talk. If I see any comments that are, if I see them, I respond to them. I care and I want to, you know, help all Sudzers out. This cool ass family that we've created here, like, this is a nice safe space for us to be. And so I'm here for you. For those of you who want to ship post to uh, me or to the other commenters at all and continue to take out your frustrations on us, in the uh, words of Angelica Schuyler, as portrayed by the absolutely iconic Renee Goldsberry, I'm not here for you. For, you. for my Sudzers, I'm here for you every day. I'm glad that you guys joined me again today for another round of 365 Days of Soap. And I will see you guys all again tomorrow for another round of Soapy Fun.
Bye.